Welcome everybody to this evening's webinar discourse on magnetism. And uh, as we do twice a week, we're going to address topics. We do address topics that help us to increase our magnetism and perhaps plug the holes in our magnetic aura, of those things that drain our magnetism. And if, you've, if you read the title to this week's uh, discussion, I wanted to talk about prayer and uh, devotion in general, but particularly prayer, because devotion, love for God is perhaps one of the most magnetic things that we can do. In a sense, when, we're, when we love God, God is expansive. It puts out a very, it's, by its very nature, it's going out to reach out to the other people to make connections. And that uh, outward expansion is very, very magnetic if you look at people in your life. For those people that love a lot, they begin to attract love back to them, and they have that magnetism. Or people who don't have that quality of love in their lives, they seem to be missing something. And you can see, they may be very brilliant uh, mentally, but if they don't have that heart quality, they're not nearly as attractive as uh, those that do. And that attractiveness is what this pulls good vibrations to us and makes us very strong in our aura. Now, when Swami Kriyananda, he writes, and he would, in, in his books he says this, but he would repeat this when he would speak to us over the years. He said when he was a young man, he went to college, and he was very intellectual. And he was extremely brilliant. I mean, he was more than just intellectual, brilliantly intellectual. He had a tremendous mind. Very, rea very rational and was able to uh, be very penetrating in his thinking. But he said he was unhappy uh, before he came onto the spiritual path because he, he, he felt empty. He knew that there was something missing from his life. And he was, of course, a spiritual seeker. He didn't know that or identify himself in that way, but he was looking for something. And he felt that part of it was that missing element. Something was missing inside of himself. And when he met Master and came to be Master's disciple, he felt that very uh, he had opened a door to being able to heal himself and to make himself whole. But Master told him very, very soon and repeated this to him. He said, Master telling Swamiji, he says, get devotion. You're so dry. You're so dry. And this touched Swami because he knew exactly what Master was saying. He felt that dryness. That is what that was, why he came to Master and what was propelling him to find a solution. And Master told him, get devotion, get devotion. Now, he didn't tell him how to get that devotion, but it was up to Swamiji. And he intuited and he began to learn various techniques and he began to pray for devotion. And Master used to say this, if you don't have devotion, pray for it. And he began to pray for that devotion. And slowly, slowly, as, he, as his, his time in discipleship went by, he began to feel that awakening uh, taking place in, the, in his heart. And I related to this very much so when Swami would tell this in, uh, throughout his life, but particularly in the early days, because in many ways I saw myself in Swami. And then I'm Probably, that's why I was attracted to him. Like attracts like, you might say. Now, I certainly wasn't brilliant like him, but I did have that, that quality of intellectuality at the expense, you might say, of the heart quality. And, I can, and so when he would speak this way, I'd say, yeah, yeah, I understand that, I understand that. And Swamiji, I began to think, well, you know, if you're, you need to get devotion, how do you be devotion? And when I would look with my limited understanding, what does devotion mean? I think of church services and rituals and offerings and prayer services and choir practices and all these sort of things that were out. And I just said, no, I don't. I, that's not for me. That's not what I want. It's very outward and didn't have any quality in, in there. And when, and when people say, well, you need to pray. And I says, well, I don't know what that, that's about even. It, I didn't say it that way, but my mind was saying, you know, I'm praying, what is that? And it's superstitious, asking for a benevolent power to give me something. 
you know, like uh, the mantra, you know, say a mantra and get something in return. And, and uh, I said, that's not for me. I can't, I'm not going to do that. And so I was struggling in this way. And I was new. I was, I, mean, I was new, but I was sincere also. I was looking for something. And I had an experience that where I got it. I began to get, or I didn't get it. I got an opening that allowed me to begin to understand what I needed to do. And it was in my first year there. I was sort of in 1969 by this time. I met Swami the year before. Before, but I moved up to the ashram in the mountains in, of California in 1969. And I, when I went there, I was one of the first batches uh, there to help start that place and get it fixed up. And I went there and I had, a, I had a truck, which I owned in partnership with somebody else. And I had a tent, I had a sleeping bag, I had a box of clothes, and I had a box of food. That was it. So I, I got there and that was plenty. I pitched my tent in the forest and it was great. And uh, I lived out of my box of food until it ran out. Then we arranged something else. We got some uh, together, we got food going. And I went like this for about, and I was immersing myself in the teachings as much as I possibly could, meditating, and finally I was in an environment. And I was still struggling with devotional element, though I knew I needed to learn about that, but I tried and the ways that other people were doing it. But after about three months, I needed to go back to where I came from, which was San Francisco Bay Area. I was a, had been a student at Berkeley. I need to go back because one is, uh, I had left a lot of things there and I needed to dispose of them and they were in a friend's apartment. I had to clean up my past a little bit. So after some months, I went, drove my truck down there and went there and I went to my friend's apartment and I went through everything that I had and I gave it everything away. I either threw it away or I gave it away. And I totally, and, and my truck, which I owned in partnership, as I, I gave that to the other, the person I had the other half of that, you might say. And, but I had no truck, I had no possessions, a little backpack. And so I asked the person I gave the truck to, I asked her if she would take me to the highway. And she said, yeah, take me to the highway. I'm going, that's it, I'm done with this. And I'm fully committed. And I left everything behind. She took me to the highway and I put my thumb out to hitchhike back to Ananda Village, which was probably about a, oh, 200, 250 kilometers away. So anyway, the guy came, picked me up. He took me about two thirds of the way. And uh, he dropped me off on a country road, two lane country road, not much traffic. And he said, oh, good luck to you. And I said, thanks, you know, thanks. And, and I began to walk down the road. There's nothing out there and I was by myself. And I was, I was talking. I says, well, here I am. I felt really good because I had, everything was gone. I says, here I am. I'm, I'm free of all that stuff. I'm heading on. I got, I've had this other life. And now I ended up here. I am on this roadway. And I'm just like a sadhu in the, in the mind. And I was just talking like this. And I stopped. And I thought, who am I talking to? Who am I talking to? And it, now, this is a simple question, what is I say it this way, but at the time, it was just like a light bulb went off in my mind. And I said, I'm talking to the universe. I'm not talking to myself, because I'm talking to the universe as if the universe is going to hear me. And, and I'm just talking. And, and I said, I've been doing this for a long time. I, matter of fact, I think my whole life I've been talking to the universe. And I thought, maybe, just maybe, Maybe God's in there somewhere. Maybe I'm talking to God. Maybe this creation, maybe that's Divine Mother. And I'm talking to Divine Mother. And I said, I don't know if that's true, but I'm going to take that as being true. And I started talking, and which continuing, you might say, what I had been doing for years. And I just turned that whole conversation that was always going on in my mind. Who am I talking to? I'm talking to you, Lord. And I and when I and it hit me, and I understood 
And now very soon after, and, and interestingly, I felt just really very uplifted because of some realization had come to me on top of all this other things that come to me. And just at that time, the car drives up to me and kind of rolls down the way. Hey, where are you going? I says, well, I'm heading. And he says, hop in, let's go. And, and he, he didn't take me quite all the way, but he got me real close. And that was, a, I took it as Divine Mother's blessing. Now, right after that, right after that, I began to, I read a very good book, which I would recommend to all of you if you have not read this book. And it was called The Letters of a Modern Mystic. And it's by a Christian missionary. It was, uh, he was a Christian missionary in the early part of the 20th century. His name was Frank Laubach. And he uh, was a missionary, I believe it was in the islands of Indonesia or somewhere like that. And he was there and he was on his own out there, not knowing what in the world to do. And he started having the same, he was in a dilemma and he didn't know what to do and he started praying. But he didn't quite know what to do about praying either. And he started talking to God. And he says, God, here I am. I don't know what to do. I'm going to, you know, and it, it just went on. And pretty soon he hit upon something. He said, I wonder if I could just pray continually. And he began carrying on a conversation with God, just talking to God silently all the time. And by that, I mean all the time. As long as he was in his waking hours, he started speaking to God. And later on in his life, when somebody would ask him to lead a prayer, he would just start verbalizing that which was going on in his conversation to God. And that would be his prayer because it was happening. It went on to the point where he became immersed in that. And eventually he went into ecstatic state with this. And at the same time about then I read, the, I read uh, Swami Ramdas's book, Ram, Ram, Sri Ram, J Ram, Ram, Ram over and over and over, and he went into ecstasy. And I began to get an idea of what needed to happen, is that we need to have that conversation with God, and we have to take it up. And instead of just thinking that we're talking to ourselves, mumbling to ourselves, which we do, if we put a little bit of direction and effort into it, we can see that we're sharing and this is what, it's not talking at God or even so much to God. It's sharing with God, with Divine Mother. Divine Mother, and then just sharing and carrying, carrying on that conversation. And this began to, especially when we do it consciously, take that approach, began to make things much more sweet, you might say, in my life. And then... That led me to another realization, because I was talking a lot to God. And then I realized, you know, I'm not listening very much because <laughs> God's not talking back to me. This seems like this is something of a one-sided conversation. And I started, but I began to, to pray, as you, as you would, you know, to not for anything, but I began to pray for God's love, to God to talk with me. Him too, to be able to feel that conversation. And of course, playing into that, of course, as we're taught in our teachings as Master taught us, is that's what meditation is also, is learning to concentrate the mind, to focus the mind, and to listen. Now, we listen with the ears, yes, in some ways we do, when we listen, you know, to the sounds, but we listen with the heart, we listen with the intuition, and of course, in our day-to-day -day life, we also have to practice that process of listening. What, and as Swami, sometimes he would say, he would say, what is trying to happen here in any situation? In other words, if we tune in to what's going on around us and try to listen to God's whispers to us through circumstances, through nature, through, through other people, and feel in a sense that everything we're doing is a dance between me and the divine, and that divine is taking shape and form in the people and the circumstances around me, 
and that every circumstance in my life is tailor-made perfectly as it should be from my past karma. But also, yes, it's not, but I'm gr not grudgingly finding myself in this situation. It's tailor-made for me to learn something and to spiritually progress. It's the perfect spot for me to make the next step in my spiritual evolution if I choose to make it. Now, I don't have to choose to make it, but if I open myself and choose, every, every moment is that opportunity. And so we keep that conversation going. I, there's a, you've heard this story probably from Mahabharata of uh, uh, Krishna says to Draupadi, she, he says, uh, well, you should practice yoga, meditation, yoga. And she says, Lord, I don't have time. I can only think of you. I'm, only, I'm so busy, just 100% always thinking of you that I have no time for anything else. Now, that's a wonderful thought. And I like to think that uh, maybe someday I would be at that position as well, because that immersion of 100% of our consciousness in God's presence, of course, is what we're trying to achieve with meditation. But I know 100% of my time I'm not thinking of God. But I try a little bit, a little bit, and as much as I can, try to take that step to be able to uh, draw that power. And the power of prayer in terms of not asking so much for something. God, give me a new car. God, I wish you'd come to me. God, you know, in a complaining voice. Or God, what this circumstance, I don't like that, I don't like this. That's just, I mean, who's going to listen to that? I mean, God does that. That just drives the divine away. But God, I give you my love. What can we give to God? And in that conversation, giving what we can give, then in a sense, then we have the right to draw back, make a loving demand, as Master would say, that God reciprocate. There's a wonderful song, Bhajan, that Swami liked to sing, and I, I can't remember the tune or whatnot, but he would, he would translate the words, and it, it would say, Divine Mother, it was, saying, it was Divine Mother saying, oh, don't ask me for my love. Don't ask me for my love. Because if I give you my love, I'll give you salvation. But don't ask me for my love. Because if I give my love away, I will be but a beggar and I won't have anything. And it was so, and Swami would say this so sweetly, that uh, you can ask for salvation, but don't ask for my love. You see, because God doesn't give his, her love away easily. And so we have to coax that love away. And so we can pray for that love. But also, if you want to pray for something to come to you, you start with giving. So we have to first learn to give our love to God and to express that love, to give our love in the privacy of our own heart, not making a big show of it and, and uh, all of that, but having that devotional attitude toward God. Now, God is in the clouds and stars. He's in all of, in, in this universe that is, this is how I see it at least, this whole universe is God in, in the sense that if we can see God hiding, it's hiding though, God's hiding. But if we can just, you might say if the perspective is a little bit, if we can change it just a little bit, God comes out of that hiding. And you realize he's been there all the time, right there in front of me. I just couldn't see it. And sometimes we're given that grace to have our eyes open. So for a moment we see, and we go, oh my God. And it reveals itself once in a while. If we're, if we're you might say, God's grace, you might say, comes to us in that moment. So, Pray that way. Pray that way. Try to give, give. But the thing that is behind all of this, and of course, getting me started, going back to that story, is it starts if you don't have you don't have devotion. And you, well, I said pray for devotion. But even before that, 
there has to be a desire in the heart for something more. And, you know, we come onto the spiritual path. Somebody was asking me today, say, why am I here? You know, and I'm supposed to answer this in a video tomorrow or next day. And I, and I thought, oh, man. <laughs> People have been asking that for <laughs> millennia. Why am I here? You know, and... We have to, and, and, but that's a good question, actually, because once a person comes to the point in their soul evolution to even ask that question, it means they're starting to wake up. It means that person's, and so, to, and you, it implies a quest. It implies a desire that is unfulfilled that we want to know. And it implies a realization that there's something more and if we even ask that question, it implies that we intuit there must be an answer to that. And yes, there is an answer. That answer, of course, is God. But no, somebody can tell you that, but that's not enough. We need to be able to experience that. And so when we, I spoke about learning to not only just have that conversation, ongoing conversation, sharing with God, but also at the same time, listening, making it a conversation, which is both participating and listening, and drawing that inspiration back to us. And so this, I think if we put this into practice, it makes our spiritual life so much more sweet. I know Swamiji, toward the end of his life, uh, in the early years, when I met him in 1968, he was a man of great willpower, great willpower. Now he had the devotional site also because he was very much working on that. But I wouldn't say that that was his primary characteristic when you first met him. His first, you know, the first characteristic was energy to me, as an energy and will to be able to accomplish something, tremendous energy. But then as he grew older, and he began to slowly, I saw, change. And then it's not that the will and the energy ever left him. Now, of course, the body began to not be as strong as it was in his earlier years, and so it didn't seem to manifest quite so much. But inwardly, he still had that very strong dynamism. But as he got older, especially in the last 10 to 15 years of his life, he became so sweet. And he even recognized it himself. He's, he's, it's as if he had passed a point in his life where a lot of those other things didn't matter to him anymore. And it was just that sense of devotion to Divine Mother and being, as to the best of his ability, a, an instrument for his guru, who he saw as an embodiment of Divine Mother. And just, just working through his whatever capacity he had left in him, he was able to, uh, to be able to express that. Now, it's remember, it's difficult, and this is what I found, it, it's difficult to have a relationship with something that you don't know. You know, people say, love God. And it becomes theoretical. You know, yes, I, that's a good concept, but until we actually know something of what we're trying to achieve, it's difficult to develop that, that love. And so this is why we have to do the various practices that Master brought to us. Master brought us these techniques, the great ones, brought us these techniques in order to give us an actual experience. You could say it's our part of that relationship if we're willing to do what has been given to us by Divine Mother, because for me, Master is Divine Mother. It's it, if Divine Mother, I want to know you, Lord. I want to get to know you. I want to hear you. I want to speak. I want to converse with you. And I always think, well, I'm never hearing anything back. Then I realized that was not true at all. Because as I began to express that, I found these techniques coming to me. I learned how to practice Kriya Yoga. I found all these great Guru Bhais coming to join me in my life. Swamiji had come into my life. And I was, I was still sometimes saying, well, where are you, God? Where are you? And, 
And then God was, if, if it could verbalize, hey, look at I'm giving you all this stuff right here. You're not paying attention. And I think if we look at, our, you look at your life and you'll see if you want God, if you don't want God, pray to want God to develop that. And then if you want, then you'll see that God begins to supply you with the instruments and the ways for you to be able to deepen that relationship. Because the, God is not necessarily going to come down from that consciousness level to my consciousness level. There's an expectation for me to need to raise my consciousness to God's level, or to at least to get a little closer than where I am now. But the beautiful thing, although that's my duty and my task in this lifetime, as it is all of us, yours too, remember that as we're trying, God is reaching down with his hand to us to lift us up. And we have to pay attention for that and allow ourselves to be lifted up. If you were like me, you'd say, well, I don't need any help. I'm going to do this myself. You know, I don't want to be a weakling. And, uh, but, uh, you know, a young man's uh, arrogance. Say, no, God. I will, I will reason, I will will, I will act, but guide thou my reason, will, and activity, and help me to be able to do that. And if you approach God in that fashion, have that conversation with God going in your mind, ask yourself that question that I ask myself, who are you talking there with there? And expand it to something beyond your own ego talking into the mirror. Think of it in terms of Divine Mothers there, right behind your thoughts listening to you. And then begin that, and you'll see that little by little, God begins to reveal herself, Divine Mother reveal herself in the circumstances around you. And you see what happens to you is not just coincidental, or not just inert. You begin to see in small ways, not superstitiously, but behind that, you begin to see that there's the divine hand supporting you in everything that you do, even in the rough parts, even in the rough parts. It's for our benefit, and we're exactly in the place we need to be to deal with the challenges and that karma that is ours right here and right now. So join us again on Monday, Monday evening. And if you're part of the Pune Sangha, you may want to tune in tomorrow at uh, 6 o'clock at our Sunday satsang. We'll be talking about some of these subjects a little bit further. I'll be leading satsang tomorrow. And then I hope to see all of you again or tune in again on uh, Monday night. Joy to you. <clears throat>